Hey ho, Tudor Minded People. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode eight of our podcast. Every episode, Jesse will read from Time's Riddle, a story project we're working on. We've had such a good time researching it and bringing it to you. Thanks to all our members. And if you're listening to this, you're like us, and you love thinking about how history connects to the present day. So stick around after the reading, because we'll be diving into some of the history. At this point in our story, we're returning to 1565. Constance is in the service of her new mistress, the fabulous Swedish princess Cecilia Vasa. So let's pick up at Chapter 8 of Time's Riddle, Read On. Mm. Chapter 8, Bedford House, in which preparations are made for a wedding and a crime. Princess Cecilia shifted in her place as a tailor draped silk over her arms. Where was I, Master Bell? Your grace was speaking of being stranded in the ice and snow of Denmark, hiding from the hostile enemies, said Master Bell, who was vigorously writing the princess's words. So we continue, said the princess. The wind was bitter and most frightening, but cheerfully calling her retinue together, the princess Cecilia said, Come hither, is this not a cold and terrible place to lodge? Are you taking this down, Master Bell? Perfectly, your grace. Sister, how we were all crying, Elizabeth remembered. My feet prickled and were numb. Dora and I rubbed them and tried to keep me warm. I so feared I would lose my toes. Oh, it was frightful. I did not think we would live. Brigitte did not add more, but all the ladies became subdued. The princess pressed her hands to her heart and then cast them in the direction of her attendants lounging on the floor. All my women were afraid. You can imagine, Master Bell, how I wanted to raise their spirits. I gathered them about me and said, Let us now talk of the mighty Queen of England, the memory of whom has always put away all troubles, fears, and dangers from my head. And so, with this happy remembrance of the English Queen, we passed over that cold and terrible night. Constance thought the open mouths of Mary and Nazareth were the finest things she had seen since moving to Bedford House. Their expressions confirmed Cecilia Vasa as simply a fantastical creature. Constance wondered what the princess's ladies truly thought of their mistress, and whether they talked about Cecilia when they were alone. Most probably they did not. Queens and nobles did not have to bear the judgment of lesser beings. And yet, anticipating their oddities and appetites, made a shrewd soul a favorite. Whatever Cecilia's caprice, it was easier to be among the house of Vasa than with the house of Tudor. The two royals had tempers worthy of the gods, but Cecilia's wrath was both short-lived and, in comparison to Elizabeth's, harmless. The Princess Cecilia put herself in peril to come to England. Mary Howard was impressed. Of course she exaggerates to flatter Her Majesty. Nazareth whispered, trying to avoid the hearing of the crowded room. Constance may be back at court with us soon. Constance had heard Cecilia's ladies talk of the diminishing gifts and invitations from Whitehall Palace. The Spanish ambassador and his gentlemen attended the princess far more frequently than the Queen's people did. Indeed, Bishop Guzman de Silva was here again, huddled in the corner with two recent additions to Cecilia's circle the adventurer Captain John Hawkins, and the handsome philosopher Cornelius de Lenoy. It was said the well-formed Dutchman was an alchemist working to make gold for the queen. Constance checked to see if there were tell-tale gold flakes beneath his fingernails, but he preened, mistaking the nature of her gaze. Read it back to me, Master Bell, Cecilia instructed. Every word must be a sword of passion to slay the English queen's heart. To the most high, mighty, and virtuous prince, Elizabeth, with the wonderful affection of your new guest, the Honourable Princess Cecilia, towards your grace, this account of her journey to England of that same princess to your highness is dedicated. Let us add perilous to the journey, said Cecilia. Princess, what a beautiful way with English you have purred Christina, Gabriel's daughter. You are a poetess. English ladies, English ladies, Cecilia called. Do you think I will shine brightly in this Swedish fashion? Terra firma will be blessed by your grace in such a gown, a Serbic Nazareth threw herself into the mood with a low curtsy. The color, your grace, 
You, it is perfect, Mary Howard tried. Only a woman as radiant as your grace would dim such a dress, said Constance. Cecilia's eyes were locked on Mary Howard, who searched the ceiling for better words. That dress with your grace in it, the fine dress, is as if... Mary wrinkled her brow. Demeter has come to lodge with us. The goddess of the harvest, who is often portrayed as a crone? Cecilia asked edgily. Nazareth stepped in. Madam, Demeter is reckoned by many to be the most beautiful, the white snow goddess, most powerful of all the Olympians. Oh, indeed, that is what I meant, my lady, Mary said. Yes, the snow goddess, the, the powerful one. Yes, yes, that was it. Cecilia's face lit up. Ah, well then, a glorious attempt, good spirit, English lassie. Now, the Earl of Bedford's daughter marries a man who will raise her status, does she not? Oh, certainly, madam, Nazareth said, but Lady Anne Russell does not come empty-handed to the match. Mary asked Nazareth under her breath, Is it true that we are to dress as Amazons at the wedding joust? So it is told, Nazareth answered without enthusiasm, and the bride will be Hippolyta. Marrying Sir Robert Dudley's brother, Sir Ambrose, is a grand step up, Cecilia said. Queen Elizabeth will listen to Anne Russell. Perhaps, if Anne is fortunate, she will become the Queen's confidant. One never knows how high the Dudleys will ascend. Yes, it is a very good marriage for the little Anne. I commend her, the dove, gentle and kind. In a gesture that seemed entirely out of character, the elusive Mistress Thomason St. John sidled into the room, holding a gown up to her body. My lady princess, do you think this gown suits me? Cecilia crooned. <gasps> Mistress Thomason speaks? All these weeks I thought the poor girl was mute. What a joy to know there is a voice inside that sly figure. Now there is an event of importance you seek my counsel, Mistress St. John. But we are friends now, are we not? Stand there. No, 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 it will not do. That shade of blue turns your skin an awful green. Thomason did not flinch. Yellow is your colour with that black hair. Yellow, yellow, yellow it must be. And do you not agree, Master Taylor? The tailor appraised Thomason. Indeed, and I will fix the lady's defects with my needle. Make the waist so small and keep her things so cool. Cecilia laughed. We will outshine the bride. I credit your family, Mistress St. John. You are fortunate to be a ward of the Earl of Bedford and kin to his daughter. Sir Robert Dudley formed this match himself with the Queen's goodwill. That is a favour to your family, and you must know the value of a connection with an older, well-positioned man. Elin Snakenborg, I will hear nothing from you. Cecilia placed her hands over her ears, causing the pins at her wrists to pop out. Constance felt sorry for the tailor, who had been working two days already, as he stopped and began to pick up the pins. Captain Hawkins, I see you there. We must speak. Cecilia pulled off the half-finished sleeves. The tailor's face crumpled. Cecilia took Hawkins by the arm and into the other room. The door closed too quickly for the captain's marmoset to follow. The bulgy-eyed creature looked about and then jumped into Constance's lap as she sat on a pillow. It was scruffy and had an odd smell. She leaned away. Mary, brush it off. I will not touch it. What if it bites? Thomas and St. John came to her rescue and lifted the creature, saying, It is an extraordinary animal, the most exotic I have ever seen. Imagine the man who dared travel to the land where this creature lives. I do not have to imagine him, said Nazareth. I saw him just a moment ago. He is extraordinary, warbled Thomason. Mary agreed. Captain Hawkins has a spicy eye. He is sunburnt, Nazareth pronounced. Oh, come, Nazareth, even you secretly wish to sail away, teased Constance. I do not. Ships are wet, Nazareth said. The door opened and Thomason sprang up, the marmoset in her arms. I must return the captain's pet. How strange that girl is, Constance said to Mary. Since I have been here, she has never spoken a word before this very hour. Well, that's odd, but Constance, what has Sir Charles Paget said? Has he sent a letter? Mary asked. Ah, said Constance, you only came to visit me, so you would have fresh talk back at court. No, I came to cheer your day, Mary lowered her voice. 
The other night, as we were all undressing for bed, Catherine Hastings undid her stomacher, and with my own eyes I saw, bound to her body, the innards of an animal. I lay my life it was the womb of a goat. Constance was intrigued. Does that truly work? Nazareth scolded. Tush, go no further, Mary. Constance is modest. Not lying with a man is what works. Mary ignored Nazareth. Constance, I heard that someone went to Mistress Perry, and she told them that tying a goat womb to your flesh would work. But the laundress, Miss Smithson, heard from a midwife in Antwerp that hanging the testicles of a bull around the neck is more to the purpose. What have you heard, Constance? Mary, Nazareth warned, I will wrestle you to the ground if you cannot sew your lip. You know the kitchen trade, Nazareth. Mary insisted. They sell animal parts to the girls who ask for them, and I stand you down saying it is a good, but then you make a face so I will leave it. You are married already, Nazareth, but with your husband in the country, even you must admire and imagine. Now, Constance, what did Sir Charles Paget write to you in his letter? He was kind, Constance said, but he is unhappy that I have been sent here. Oh, that bodes well, said Mary. Do you wish to lie with him without your clothes on? I will get you some animal innards. Tush, Mary, modesty, you must get yourself married, Nazareth announced, adding. It is time for us to return to court. Shift yourself, Mary. Constance accompanied Mary and Nazareth to the door and watched them plunge into the crackly air. Turning back into the house, she saw Bishop Guzman de Silva standing placidly at the bottom of the stairs. She was adult. Did he wish to go out? Was he pausing for a reason? Was he praying over something? It was his own business, yet brushing past him to return to Cecilia's chamber seemed rude, and he was so very enormous, blocking the way. She curtsied. I would have a word. He had spoken to her. She did not expect that. She curtsied again. Mistress, you are an earnest Catholic. Your aunt, your family, they are well known to me. Constance's eyes locked on his left shoulder. Looking into his face was hardly possible. His expression would have portent. Was his brow furrowed? She rolled her eyes up quickly. He was serious. His scrutiny was not at all that worrisome. In fact, the opposite. A kindness surrounded him. Young mistress, there is a devout lady in prison. She may die at any moment in peril of her soul. She has not been able to take the host other than a false one given her by a heretic for some weeks now. You will have the honor of taking holy bread to her. A servant will come for you when the time is right. He will bring the host in a burse. When you return here to Bedford House, put the burse under the statue of Pan in the garden. Do exactly as instructed, and you will come to no harm. Constance knelt reflexively muttering agreement to the bishop's words, as if responding to a prayer. Young mistress, I will hear your confession. Constance began, grateful to this kind priest. Guzman absolved her, then put his hands on her head and blessed her. Constance felt pure, powerful, an angel of mercy charged by God. Then alone, out of the bishop's sphere, the nature of the task she had been given struck her, it could get her banished, imprisoned, or much worse. Had Guzman heard her confession in case she was discovered? She wondered if she could run after the bishop and suggest Nazareth take the duty. Nazareth was very good with criminal arrangements. Plus, Nazareth was already married. Constance wanted to experience a few things before she died. This chapter begins with Cecilia dictating her story of traveling to England from Sweden. She really did have the story printed and presented to Elizabeth. And you can even read it online, even now. I think Elizabeth hoped by sharing how hard it had been to get to England, she would get extra credit from Elizabeth. And things were going a little south with Elizabeth at this time because Cecilia was a very expensive guest and Elizabeth was getting tired of it. And who knows if this story of her travels worked. I mean, Elizabeth was pretty savvy and she probably knew when she was getting played. But anyway, we introduce a lot of new characters in this chapter. So one of my favorites is Cornelius de Lenoy. He was a real person, and he professed to be an alchemist. William Cecil, the queen's right-hand man, was interested in alchemy. And a lot of very smart people at the time were, because it was a type of science. No one ever 
actually turned base metal into gold, but some very interesting results came out of playing with the chemicals. The alchemists weren't a bunch of con artists. That's a misperception. They believed that there were essential particles and that these particles could be taken apart and reformed. And when they were reformed, you could make them into anything. And that's not an unreasonable belief. No, Cecil actually hired Delanoy to turn metal to gold for the queen. But of course, Delanoy failed. Anyway, Delanoy hung around in London hoping to get back into the queen's good graces. And Delanoy made a very strong impression on Princess Cecilia, probably because she was able to borrow a lot of money from him and she was running out of cash. But in our story, there will be a lot more to come about Delanoy and about alchemy. But right now, let's move on. So let's introduce a very problematic character, and that is Captain John Hawkins. At the time of our story, he's only a merchant and a sea captain. In 1564, Hawkins set out with Francis Drake on a voyage to Africa to bring back goods and, more horribly, to sell slaves to the Spanish colonies in what we now call South America. Both William Cecil and the Queen herself invested in this voyage because Hawkins' previous voyage had been so incredibly successful and he had made such a profit on it. I mean, the Queen certainly knew about the slave trade. Even if she didn't condone slavery in public, you know, she was happy to profit from it. She turned a blind eye to the horror and pocketed the money. Like so many people did. It, well, suffice to say that Hawkins was a slave trader as well as a merchant in spices and other goods. And the English courtiers of Elizabeth's time were falling over each other to invest in his voyages and to make money off selling captured African people. But slavery is such a big, terrible, sweeping subject. I don't think we can do justice to that topic in this podcast. Mm. No, I don't believe we can. Actually, this section is about something very... Different. (laughs) Different. Uh, Sort of a very average occurrence in the court, which is a royal wedding. And it's the wedding between Ambrose Dudley, who is Robert Dudley's brother, and the daughter of the Earl of Bedford, who is Anne Russell. This wedding was the big event of the fall of 1565 because it was held at court and it lasted for days. Anyway, we're going to devote an entire chapter to the wedding, but there are very detailed accounts from the wedding at the time that it occurred. So we're able to take almost all the details from real events for this story. So let's talk a little bit more about Bishop Guzman de Silva. Uh, We've introduced him before, but he's really such an important part of this story. So here in this chapter, he asks Constance to ferry the host to a prisoner of the queen. So we'll find out in the later chapters who that prisoner is in our book, but it is a historical fact that Guzman was very much involved with the secret world of English Catholics who were loyal to the Pope. These English Catholics looked to his master, King Philip of Spain, as a kind of savior. Right. Guzman is an incredible source of information for this time period because he kept up a detailed correspondence with King Philip during the entire time he was serving as the Spanish ambassador. And he was pretty candid because diplomatic letters were not opened by the authorities. And I imagine some of the more secret details were originally written in code. The letters are a great read and they can be found in the Spanish state papers, which are all online. So at this time, the Spanish were heavily supporting Mary Queen of Scots and looked on her as a possible Catholic heir to Elizabeth's throne. I mean, Guzman had a lot of communication with Mary's ambassadors from Scotland And he conveyed a lot of that information back to King Philip. He also sent impressions of Elizabeth to Philip. And Guzman found her very compelling, very intelligent, but very capricious. Guzman also spent a lot of time with Princess Cecilia. He got around. (laughs) Cecilia was from a Protestant country, but she married the Margrave of Baden-Baden. And that's a Catholic principality. And Cecilia herself was fluid about religion. She professed a great admiration for King Philip. Right. So Thomas and St. John is a character we did create, but the family is real. So the Earl of Bedford's wife was a St. John. And in our story, Thomasin is a relation on that side. But there's also some super misinformation in this chapter, the birth control. You mean slinging bull testicles around your neck won't keep you from getting pregnant? 
<laughs> we did read that at court, the young ladies would buy these innards and all kinds of things from the kitchen at Whitehall. It's such an odd idea. It's so much more about superstition than science. I mean, we'll never know what was the origin of this idea. Why did they think it would work? I don't know. I don't know either. But I know that even the famous Blanche Perry, who was so close to Elizabeth, was rumored to dispense birth control advice. And also, Cecilia Vasa was accused of giving advice about how to avoid becoming pregnant. So all these things that Mary talks about to Constance were actual strategies for birth control at the time. But there was also some better informed advice. And I'm guessing a lot of that was Cecilia's. But we will be getting into that in later chapters. But we really wanted to include this topic of birth control because we know it must have been on these young ladies' minds at the time. I mean, of course, the ideal was that you would be a virgin at the time of marriage, but clearly that wasn't always the case. And in fact, a third of all women were pregnant when they got married. I mean, sure, the church disapproved of any kind of birth birth control and tried to suppress information about it. But, you know, I'm sure that didn't stop women from trying to control their bodies. Anyway, that's all we have time for today. As always, we have more info on our Facebook page. Right, so see you next time. And remember to listen for more Times Riddle and more tutor minded talk. And also, please leave us comments and thank you for listening.
And, you know, Right, so see you next time, and remember to listen for more Times Riddle and more tutor-minded talk. Bye!